All right, it's a Rebecca sode. So let's get into it. What do you say? There's some good questions here. Okay, I'm excited. Annual upper tier patron, anonymous. She says, "Dear Dr. K and Rebecca, can you educate our older listeners about non-binary people? Mm. What is it, and why do they feel the need to be to be part of one gender or the other? I want to understand so I'm compassionate to these people. Mm. I grew up in the '80s in a very conservative area, and most people my age here have no understanding of this." Mm-hmm. But the younger generation does. My son is in his first year of college, and he has two non-binary friends. Mm-hmm. They are both biologically girls. So what would you say to this individual, Rebecca? Well, I think it's really hard in our culture. Uh, that's so. There's so many rules around male and female to realize that you can step out of that really binary story. So if the term non-binary suggests that there has been a binary in the past and we are existing in a binary that there's two poles there's a way to really be a man and there's a way to really be a woman and you can live in those stories and it's great for a lot of people um but then there's a sense that there's a lot of gray area so what if you weren't firmly in one of those poles what if you rejected some of being masculine and went towards some of being feminine but enjoyed some parts of being masculine so it's like um i don't know it's like if you opened up the whole color palette and just got to you know choose what you wanted dress the way you wanted dress outside of gender norms um view your internal landscape outside of gender norms so it's accepting of a very wide variety of presentation and thought style and being in the world. So me having a teen this age, when we discuss gender, me and my kiddo, um, (laughs) they believe that gender is gone. And most of the people of their generation do, here in Seattle, do as well. Uh, There's no reason to exist in that binary at all. And they can present in all kinds of ways. So if anything gets discussed in a very gender specific way, I get a lot of pushback. Why would I think that way? Why would I think that that's a man's job? Why would I think that that's the way a woman should dress? Um, So it's like, just everything's just kind of wide open and there's all kinds of ways to be. And I had a beautiful conversation with my aunt about this, who said that some of the people of her generation in the town that she lives in, are starting to identify as non-binary. And we just had this really interesting conversation about how gender hasn't worked out for a lot of people. I mean, gender hasn't worked out for me. (laughs) Like being female, being considered a wife and a mother as my primary role, it's not really great. It doesn't really get me anything. Having a wide variety of ways that I can present myself and dress and talk. I mean, even on this podcast, the way that I get reacted to as the quote woman is very intense. A lot of negativity comes at me because I'm speaking from the female voice. People don't want me to be this smart and gracious and opinionated, right? Because that's not the way that a woman presents. I find the way that (laughs) I find those crazy kids these days, it's very liberating and joyful. I mean, the way that so many people are scared of it If you just spend time with somebody who's reveling in their non-binariness, it's really beautiful. Yeah. The internet and the news and Fox News are presenting a straw person, if you will. And if you actually hang out with these people, there's no threat. There's a lot of flexibility. All the non-binary people that I know in my life are frequently misgendered, but they don't react. They're just, they're not happy about it, but they don't think ill of someone, particularly if they are older and recognize that it is harder for some people. They are lovely, wonderful, free, liberated individuals leading the way. So it's unfortunate that the public discourse is just so backward and angry and straw person-y, you know? Well, and scared to release their own identities. I mean, I, I, you might have seen on Facebook that um, somebody that I got a lot 
from in my early 20s uh, passed away of a brain aneurysm at um, 56. So I met th this person identified by this name their whole life, uh, Chip Phillips. And um, I met them when they were the administrator at um, Alice B. Theater, which is a wonderful gay and lesbian theater company here in Seattle. And um, over their lifetime, they had lots of jobs. And towards the end of their lives, they identified as non-binary. And um, the Gender Justice League spoke at their um, at the memorial that was this Saturday. Um, but probably the most touching moment was the slideshow that got put up of Chip's life. And so you saw this young, very butch person all through their lives being really masculine, identified, and um, what it looked like for them and, and the world they had to to straddle and uh, many of the people there spoke um, to the joy that Chip found at the end of their lives being non-binary. And that was the first funeral I had attended of a non-binary person. And uh, pronouns were um, discussed at the beginning of the funeral and everyone identified by their pronouns and half the people there messed up <laughs> Chip's pronouns as they were speaking and we you know it was just kind of beautiful as we all kind of fumbled around in it for ourselves um you know but there we were celebrating the life of someone who'd impacted so many people and they to find happiness in themselves had to let go of being female identified and that hurts me in no way at all mm -hmm. i can still be completely feminine identified completely female identified and so this idea that like someone else's identity is somehow like encroaching on mine or taking from me or I'm not gonna get enough. You know, I mean, that's where it gets super messed up. It's like Chip finding themselves just meant that they were even happier at the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. Why would we want to crush that? Yeah. If not, because it's our own selfishness. Right, yeah. I, I, have, one, I have one more. <laughs> me, please, me, 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 me. Please. I mean, and the other thing, I say this every time, and I just get blasted on YouTube when I say it, but freaking buy a book, people. Like, Getting to They, Them is one of my favorite books to hand the older relatives in our family of what on earth is happening here. And everyone, so again, the name of the book is Getting to They, Them. If none of this makes any sense to you, pick up a book, read read about it. Uh, go on YouTube and look at some of the non-binary comedians out there. They're freaking hysterical. Um, what do you get blasted for? What are you worried about getting blasted about? Uh, I don't know. People don't like that you're supposed to read a book on something that you don't know anything about. <laughs> like they would say, how dare you recommend that I read a book on something? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, right. But if like this is confusing to you, like just like if the weather was confusing to you or you didn't know what to pack on a trip, you would probably go to someone who was an expert on that subject and learn from them. Mm -hmm. And we are so lucky right now and that there's so many people being so gracious and open about their experience and the joy they find in stepping into their experience. It's just lovely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, at this point, you can listen to a non-binary singer, laugh with a non-binary comedian. <laughs> you can read a book by a non-binary person um, and just, you know, spend some time with it and see that it's not so scary. And, and for folks who are above our generation, who are literal boomers, if you can have a realistic conversation about how gender truly impacted your life, that's some profound stuff. I mean, the gender norms of the 40s and 50s were no joke. Mm -hmm. Like uh, my dearly departed neighbor, Pat, told the story. She was a woman. She was single her whole life. She bought her own house, which meant like she was one of the first generation of women to not have to have a husband or a father co-sign the loan for her. She led this radical life considering that she was about my mom's age. Um, she told this story that in Centralia, in the 50s, in gym class, the boys and the girls would both suit up for gym, but the boys would play basketball and the girls would just sit in the bleachers in their sports 
in their little pinafores for gym class. Um, so if you are of the boomer generation, have a conversation with your friends about how gender norms impacted your life, what you were allowed, what you lost, what you gained, how you suffered. I mean, let's just all have a conversation about gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the, here's the deep conversations, Kirk Honda. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Along those lines, patron Leah, or Leia, I always get that wrong. I know. L-I-E-A-H. Leia? Leah. Leah. That's Leah. Yeah, okay. I'm horrible with the vowels and the consonants. It's very confusing. Well, she even provides like pronunciation guides in the past. And <laughs> you even st that's I keep, like I Tara, keep forgetting. Tara Tara for me. Yeah. There's women, I won't even say their name. I'll just be like, hey, T, what's up? Because I like, <laughs> I know I'm going to get the A sound wrong. She says, I recently saw a thread on Twitter from a person in Florida whose therapist told her, per her employer, that clients should not report any plans to have abortions mm. to their therapists mm -hmm. until after the fact. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be to prevent liability mm -hmm. on the end of the therapist mm -hmm. and to prevent the therapist from needing to report the plans to obtain an abortion to the state as a part of their mandatory reporter status. Mm -hmm. I'm vehemently pro-choice and am currently getting my MSW and plan to work as a therapist in Missouri where this kind of thing could apply. Mm -hmm. While I can sort of see how someone who is vehemently anti-abortion and being an asshole about it could logic this out to be part of mandatory reporting, I find the concept extremely troubling and unethical. Yes. I wanted to know your thoughts about the ethics of this as a provider and how you might approach these limitations if it were you. Thanks so much for all your wonderful content. Uh, yeah, so what's your response to that Rebecca yeah so here we are at the handmaid's tale and that's a little bit scary um yeah I mean all of us are watching these <laughs> Kirk, I've just got the mic like up my nose um yeah all of us are I am I'll just speak from my own experience I am watching all of this just horrified um I heard something similar is happening in Texas where therapists are telling clients uh, the same thing. Um, so this idea that therapists cannot be there for their clients' mental health while they're making difficult choices because the state would step in and decide that abortion is akin to child abuse, which it's not. It actually, abortion actually helps child welfare and is that point is well documented um so yeah it's it's a very very strange time and i would hope that this isn't true uh therapists tend to be a very thoughtful bunch and don't want to do anything wrong i'd love to hear from a therapist in florida or texas if they're what mandate they've gotten um, you know, like, does the state write a letter and tell them this? Is this just what they're deciding on their own volition? Is this in a Florida ethics class? Sometimes with therapists, you don't know. Like, some therapists kind of decide, oh, I have to err in the most cautious place. We're famous <laughs> for this. Um, some of us are a little bit more nuanced than that. Yeah, well, so we're recording this in the... At the end of March, this episode might come out far later than that. Who, so knows, who knows what will what happen, happen in that <laughs> time? Now and then. But generally speaking, in our field, since there are so few actions taken against us, there are so few court precedents made, a lot of these questions that have been around for decades, not this one, but similar ones, have never really been answered, particularly mm -hmm. when you go state by state, because you might have an answer in one state, but that precedent in that state doesn't necessarily apply to a neighboring state. So, so, like, an example that I'm thinking of is people who treat um, folks who are undocumented mm -hmm. and um, all the legal issues that come up with that. But Yeah. They, yeah. I also remember hearing, I can't remember exactly where the ethics experts landed, but if someone had HIV and they were having sex. Oh, yeah. That's a classic. There was, classic Kirk Conda. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> there was... I remember talk about how it was maybe it was considered illegal if you don't report that person mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, for a lot of therapists in these jurisdictions, I'm guessing that 
they are going to be careful, but they will probably err. This is just anecdotally. They'll probably err on the side of, look, if a client wants to talk about their upcoming abortion, I'm not going to tell them not to talk with me mm -hmm. about it, but I'm going to be careful how I document mm -hmm. it. I might also even just tell the client, look, you and I, we can't talk about the fact that you even talked about it with me. Mm -hmm. so, oh, right. That's a whole other point. So don't tell other people that you told me because mm -hmm. I could actually get in trouble. I don't know that, but I don't want to create a, a world where you as a client can't talk about your life in this way. So go ahead and talk about it. But just for my sake, don't tell the people <laughs> that you mm -hmm. told me. And it won't be in your record. I, I can't reflect it in your records. I don't know if I can get in trouble. So I, I don't know if a lot of therapists will do that. You could absolutely consider that to be a, an example of where ethics and morality diverge from legality, which has happened throughout our history, right. obviously. And also the urge to rebel against the imperialist state. Like here I am, I'm staring at all of this Star Wars stuff and I'm thinking, you this know, is definitely a Darth Vader movie. This is a fucking Darth Vader moment. Um, right, like if if uh, Imperial forces are coming at me, I'm going to work for the real emotional person that's in front of me. Mm -hmm. And um, addressing the need or desire to terminate a pregnancy is a gift that I will never deny a client how we're going to deal with it in the current political landscape is another story. But, yeah. you know, I, I'm with the resistance here. <laughs> Thank God we live on the West Coast. Yeah. That's what I would say. And our freedoms are well protected here. But also like looking, I think it was in Kansas where this was on the ballot to deny women abortions and people went door to door to address yeah. with their neighbors what it meant to people of reproductive age that their ability to have an abortion would be taken away um and so this idea that it doesn't have to be decided by our government the right to choose but actually the person whose body it is can choose quite easily and for their own health and for, and their and for their doctor to help them make their that choice mm -hmm. um yeah so i think what will happen is there will be in the next five years uh, this will become more of a legal reality tested in courts with when it comes to physicians but with therapists i'm guessing at some point it's going to come up and we're going to see how the uh, the court system uh, reacts to this we could even end up in the supreme court who knows mm -hmm. but or there's a chance that like with hiv from what, what i remember there's a lot of talk about that and mm -hmm. there's a lot of worry about it but in the end it just never came to be tested and uh, don't call me on that of course I, but one of the ways that this would be tested is if you did have a client who told a therapist mm -hmm. that they were gonna you know you could imagine it would be like a, a teenager like a 17 year old mm -hmm. and she crosses state lines to get an abortion the parents find out they're upset mm -hmm. they uh, ask the 17 year old you know who knew about this and 17 year old says well my therapist did or it's in the record or something and the parents uh, alert the authorities the authorities try to go after the therapist that sort of scenario is it's pretty rare that kind of that kind of action right. it could happen of course but people don't typically go after therapists in this way but i don't know as i say that scenario out loud you know i could imagine that happening especially in today's climate i could even see anti-abortion activists trump uh, trying to create a situation like that so they yeah. can go after therapists and also i mean there's a way in which really our client records are really protected it's not not that you can't just access a client's records right so it would be interesting to see if the therapist doesn't document the same conversation in which the client reports. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, would there be weight in that way in court either way? Mm -hmm. Or as a part of covering your own ass, but still providing good therapy, you have this 17 year old person who is talking about possibly getting an abortion. And as a part of your covering out your own ass you're just like so i just have to tell you that there's a legality here i want to inform you there's also 
there's a possible morality exploration here, I suppose, and we can talk about that. And then you document that part of it, right? Mm-hmm. That you, you you inform them of, of what the laws are and what maybe their parents would want them to do or something. And that the therapist documents that they said to the client, you should consider this. But then after that, you talk about, hey, so tell me, so now I've got that out of the mm-hmm. way. Let's go you ahead. You tell and, me. And then as a therapist, you're not encouraging or discouraging. You're just listening and and validating and going along with you're not pushing back mm-hmm. obviously and you're giving the vibe that you're okay with what's happening or you're not saying it's a bad thing and uh, you document that you just listened but there's no clear indication of influence from the therapist which, which really shouldn't be happening right. anyway yeah yeah mm-hmm. i mean what could a therapist possibly it's funny i mean i do give referrals <laughs> So, I mean, and I could see, too, like, they're giving a referral to a crisis line for real details or something. Like, it would be interesting to see state by state, like, could I mention the states where it is legal or, mm-hmm. yeah, there's just a ton I don't know with this question. And people in these states, rise up. Yeah. And, like, And write us. I mean, we want to know what it's really like. You can, you can change this with your votes. That's what we do in these. That's why in our state of Washington, we don't have this problem because we have a majority voice Mm -hmm. in this part of the world. Try to get out there and and vote and change people's minds about just a lot of things, including this. So it's it's not we're not doomed by any (laughs) means. All right. Let's take a break. We get back. Let's talk about how we're not doomed. What do you say? I've been I'm down. All right, we're back from the break. So let's all get Rebecca's Instagram follower count to above a thousand. Go to our text on Instagram. That's R T E X T, and become a follower. And you can be that thousandth follower, that coveted thousandth follower. You don't get a prize or nothing, but you do get. You do the, get cute photos of my dog. Yeah. An occasional well done food photograph yeah you get exclusive photos of me and kirk yeah yeah photos you won't see anywhere else so our text at instagram do it now anonymous annual patron from norway i love international questions she says i have learned in therapy over the last two years that i have trauma i have done emdr and it seems to have calmed down my reactivity a lot However, I seem to have gathered other friends with trauma. It's like we get each other. I really struggle to connect with what seems to be healthy mainstream people. I hear you. Like Rebecca, (laughs) I also make fast comments about details I see in my surroundings. Do you know what she's referring to? Yeah, I that you just kind of you call it like it is. Yeah. Okay. Fast comments about the details. It's like my friends get those. I'm often told I'm hilarious, but it seems I'm perceived as odd and too much by most people. I get it. Rebecca mentioned something similar from school auctions. Yes. I would love for you to dig deeper on this. Mm -hmm. I too have a narcissistic and exploiting mom who would choose all these men over us kids. Mm -hmm. I moved out as a 16 year old. I have difficulty asking for help. Being assertive is also hard. Rebecca and I seem to have a lot in common, but I can tell that she has come much further in her healing, or at least in her analysis. <laughs> would love to hear, would love to hear more about friendships and social relationships from, from Rebecca. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally hear you, anonymous patron in Norway. That you know, I think if you have been through a lot, you play less with the social norms you play less in kind of regular social constructs because you don't really care and they haven't really served you and they haven't benefited you in any way so yeah there is a way in which my comments people consider them off color or too loud or inappropriate and it's because i'm just not kind of playing i'm really bad at playing nice it's not worth my time um, which means that like you put me at the school auction and it's going to be trouble because everybody else is like so buttoned down. So just talking about the weather and Seattle sports teams. Oh, so I'll tell this example. This is really interesting. Um, I might have told the story already. So uh, it was 
school auction for Garfield High School in Seattle, Washington. One of the most diverse, cool high schools we have. Um, go Bulldogs. And uh, the so it's this really diverse community. And, it's a good music program. Oh, excellent. I think they win like jazz at Lincoln Center like every other year. Yeah. Um, they have a fantastic drum line. It used to be when I was really sad, I would track down videos of their drum line. Macklemore went there. Hmm. Um, yeah, really fantastic place. Produces a lot of really amazing kids. I was lucky enough to get to hang out with a bunch of those amazing kids. Um, so, so I'm ex so I'm at the school auction, and I'm kind of expecting that. <laughs> the it was just odd. I thought the auctioneer would reflect that community. But no, he's like the most heterosexual guy and um, saying things like, you know, which lucky husband is going to buy this next item for their lucky wife? Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like half the kids in the room are queer. Half the parents are queer. Well, even if not, like, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, and so... Who it's, was it? Do you know who it was? Oh, I don't, I don't know the name. It wasn't a famous person? No, no, no. Because sometimes John Curley, do you know him? Oh, name? Lord. No, it wasn't John Curley. Because, you know, he does those things. So I, when I left, I left them with a list of like, hi, this auctioneer was inappropriate for this community. If you want people like me to come back next year, do not have this person as an auctioneer. Here are several appropriate auctioneers for this community but it was really interesting i was at the table and like people were getting nervous and somebody looked at me like are you gonna say something and i said to them oh honey i don't come to these events to see myself reflected and like the whole table just kind of went silent because i'd fucking called it out right um but it was like <laughs> so seattle like people kind of want to acknowledge that's inappropriate but they like don't want to hear you go off right and, you know, I know because of my trauma background, if something needs to be said, I'm just going to say it. And not everybody's comfortable with that. Yeah. So is it true that you are further along in your healing? Oh, like, God. how did you get there? Probably no. But, you know, I think we've talked about this. I think I added it up for my trauma podcast with you. I think I've spent over $100,000 on therapy in my lifetime over 30 years. I mean, and what I, does that therapy involve for you? Oh, my God. I've done everything. I've done a couple rounds of EMDR. But what sort oh. of transformations do you have to go through? <sighs> Breathing. I had to learn how to breathe. I had to learn how to self-regulate and co-regulate with another person. I had to learn how to trust my gut and trust when a situation was wrong. Instead of downplaying it? Yeah. Yeah. Or being like, oh, it'll just get better. That that person will get over their coke addiction. <laughs> I had to learn when situations were just too dangerous and I needed to leave. Um, I had to learn to head towards the light, head towards people who were good to me. Uh, God, there's so many things I had to learn. I had to learn that I was worthy of love. How did you do that? I mean, gosh, so many therapy sessions. For me, my therapists are just trying to get me to get present in the room. So that meant like, you know, feel the chair, breathing, tell a piece of my story, tolerate it, be witness that my story is really messed up, um, knowing that my story doesn't define me. Uh, you know, I mean, there's just countless small steps. And I know people often like compare each other. So I don't know how old you are, but I'm 52. Um. So, you know, at different times in the spiral, you learn different lessons. Having a kid, I learned all those lessons again, brutally. <laughs> Nothing pushes your drama buttons like having a kid. Um, it sounds like you had to learn that you matter. Yeah. My opinion matters. Even though intellectually you would know that 25 years ago, but you didn't feel it necessarily. Or that I got to, not only did it matter, but I got to act on my opinion. You could take up space. Yeah. It's okay to be you. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to be. Thrown. And there's going to be people who really enjoy me too. Mm. I mean, I'd say, you know, when you have a narcissistic mother, 
you just assume all the time that you've got it wrong or you're going to be rejected. And over time, you meet people who don't reject you and enjoy you mm-hmm. and are like, hey, do more of that. That was freaking hysterical or mm-hmm. I really learned something from you. I mean, that was one of the really interesting things. So uh, Chip's memorial had an open mic at the end and I was the last person to speak. and. I was coming off the stage and Rebecca M. Davis, who's a very famous MC actress in Seattle, you've probably seen her in productions. Um, she grabbed my hand as I was coming off the stage to thank me. It was just like this really simple poignant moment. I was like, oh, <laughs> I just took up space and it spoke to one of my favorite performers. It spoke to her in her heart, you know, like, that I, I think when you've been through a lot of trauma, you can kind of miss those moments. Mm-hmm. Um, I describe it to my clients as shavasana. So in yoga, after you've done all the crazy stretches, you're supposed to lie down for 10 minutes and let it all kind of resettle in your body. And um, I think when you're a trauma survivor, you're like, you know, oh, I felt something, and yeah, keep going, and maybe, you know, ooh, you know, you can really rush through life. And so slowing way down, like how long do I need to integrate that? I, I need some more time for myself. Mm. Um, I need to eat more good food. I need to eat more chocolate. I need to eat more bad food, you know, but like just finding your own rhythm is really a thing. Mm. Yeah, well, that is glorious that you <laughs> went on that that journey. I, I mean, I, yeah, obviously there's a lot of details to that, but it's, I'm guessing inspirational to people. Well, and no patron that um, there are a lot of dark days. You know, it's not it's not a kind of a uphill. It's definitely I like the spiral analogy better. There's going to be times where you're able to integrate. There's going to be times where you get even more lost, and you're thinking maybe you're worse off. And then there's going to be a moment where you're like, oh, I, I got I got something here. <laughs> and I really see it in the people around me. Um, just the people that are in my life. I'm like, look at that person. They're freaking amazing. You know, I mean, it just, or I see it in my own kid. Like, look at my healthy teen successfully working and going to school and having friends and yeah, having hobbies. Um, so, yeah, sometimes if you can't see the markers in yourself, it's a beautiful marker that you've got friends to laugh at your jokes. I mean, I, if someone doesn't laugh at my jokes, I literally can't spend time with them. So the fact that you've found people that get your sense of humor, you know, not everybody's going to think you're funny. Not everybody's that smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I remember you saying to me that someone or you'd heard before that you were too much for them. And I remember immediately just thinking, huh? Like, that's not my experience of you at all. I have another friend that is told that Mm -hmm. that's his insecurity he'll say yeah i you know i get i get told that i'm too much for them and i'm constantly worried that i'm going to be too much for people but i have a hard time not being me Mm -hmm. (laughs) or something and i don't know i i can't really figure out what it is that other people are reacting to And and for you i wonder if it's just that they equate being real and authentic and honest and having the normal ups and downs of one's emotional life and reactivity that they interpret it as a threat or or that they have to fix it or that you're going to turn on them Mm -hmm. you know i i think this isn't how i see it but i think a lot of people will have this heuristic if you have someone that's always polite and always nice and never assertive you will generalize that. I think there's this tendency to generalize that towards I'm always safe with that person. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I experience. Mm -hmm. What I experience is that person is a bottled up nightmare. (laughs) Right. I don't want to know that person because late at night, you know, it's like gremlins. Like you put water on that person (laughs) after midnight, it's going to get messy. I mean, not necessarily, but at at the very least, if someone... I want to see variety in the people I know. Well, it is trust inducing in that like with you i know that you'll say things you will say what's on your mind and so i know that you're not hiding anything and if there is something that 
you want to get off your chest, even if it's directed at me, you'll mm -hmm. say it. And that makes me feel more safe, you know? Mm -hmm. um, life has moments of annoyance with the people that you love mm -hmm. or you want to ask them for something. And if you're not getting annoyed, if your close relationships aren't getting annoyed with you sometimes, or they aren't expressing annoyance with you sometimes, You're then one, <laughs> one, you don't have close enough relationships, mm -hmm. or two, you have people in your life who are hiding things from mm -hmm. you. And that just doesn't lend itself to happiness and security and closeness, you know? The, you know, we evolved to get annoyed. Mm -hmm. It's It's there for a reason. In the caveman days, when there would be someone that would be sleeping with their cold feet pressed up against your back, <laughs> you get annoyed with it and it, it, it interferes with your sleep. And so we evolved to go, mom, <laughs> you know, Sarah has her, <laughs> you know, Sarah, what would be a name of a shrink me? Yeah. <laughs> has a, her cold feet against my <laughs> back again. Yeah. It, it's, it's normal and it should be happening all the time. And to be constantly polite and fake, I, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to be around that. Yeah. More, more crankiness, everyone. It's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question, and then we'll get to a, a, a topic you wanna you wanted to talk about today, but oh, before that. I can't remember what it is now. Longtime patron Simone, she says, when seeking therapy, is it acceptable to ask a practitioner what their views are on moral topics such as vaccines? Mm. Just chiming in here. Vaccines is not a moral topic. It's a scientific one. Uh, this... It, this confusion between morality and science and ethics, I find, and I know that there's many different definitions of moral, but people will say like, I'm, I'm against gay marriage because it's a, it's a moral. And I'm like, that's not a moral, that's a mm -hmm. bigoted notion from, I guess you're the pulpit that you're, the church that you go to. That's not morality. Mm -hmm. It's immoral that you're anti-gay marriage. <laughs> that's immoral. You know, on the on a fundamental level, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's harmful. It is not your place. It is a completely made up weird idea that you get from God knows where that is immoral. So being against vaccines is being against the data. It's like walking outside when the sun is shining and saying the sun isn't shining. Are there problems with the vaccines? Yeah. But on average, and especially when you talk about large populations, you talk to any anyone who understands anything about biology, you talk to any competent physician, any scientist, they will say it's a better idea if everyone gets vaccinated, mm -hmm. unless there's a serious reason as to why they can't, a legitimate reason anyway. So it's not a moral topic, but that's not what Simone, Simone, <laughs> Simone is just- Focus, Kurt, uh, focus. Yeah. Um, I was doing remote therapy through an online app. Recently, it became clear that my therapist might be an any vaccine mm -hmm. stance might take an anti-vaccine stance it didn't affect our work directly since we weren't since we were working remotely you know meaning that if the therapist wasn't vaccinated that kind of, but it really disturbed me that she was anti-vaccine i have extremely strong opinions about this and some of my relational problems have to do with politics and vaccines dividing my family mm -hmm. it made me not want to work with the therapist anymore i am so repulsed by this mm -hmm. is it okay or ethical to make sure that potential new therapists share my view on vaccines rebecca what do you think yeah i mean i think there are going to be issues these days that you you probably want to be on the same page with with your therapist um i know a lot of my colleagues are very clear on their websites about where they are in that they'll only see vaccinated people and there's probably the other side as well i mean you know people come to me because they know i'm pro gay they know i'm pro abortion they know i'm pro poly they know i'm pro they know i'm a raging feminist they know i'm jewish you know like um so we are in a time you know it used to be like therapist blank slate um you wouldn't know anything about your therapist but i think the times that we're in are really different so if you had a therapist for yourself mm -hmm. who had some opposing points of view that didn't relate to the therapy but somehow you just heard or you saw on their instagram hmm. or something what would you do 
and say you like the therapist. Right. Yeah. I mean, I might have to have a conversation. I mean, the 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 the, the theme here is, am I safe with you? Hmm. And so, you know, I think that's something, especially in this day and age, we're constantly asking each other, like, you know, can we co-regulate together? Um, I'm trying to think if I ever have had a client, I mean, a therapist that said something to me that made me question them so hard. Um, yeah, we've never known as much as we know about each other as we do now. Right. So that I think we're kind of in a new time with that. I mean, for you and me in Seattle, we can pretty much know that there's a really good chance that our therapists share our point of view about a lot mm-hmm. of things. <laughs> yeah. Because we are such a, you know, not extremely, but kind of a, a micro monoculture when it comes to certain ideas. You know, my neighborhood, for example, and the surrounding neighborhoods, I don't see a, if I didn't, if I wasn't online or watching the news, I wouldn't know that. Trump Re- existed. I, or Yeah. Trump or Republicans <laughs> existed or anti-gay people. Hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't know that those people were alive, mm-hmm. but it, you know, you step outside of Seattle, you go up to Linwood, or you go to Bellevue, or you know, for other places. I mean, Bellevue is pretty liberal too, obviously. But but for me, the only analogy I can think of or actual situation is when I had a client who saw in my disclosure that I was pro LGBTQ, and he coded that as I'm liberal, and which he was correct, and he came, he was Republican and worked in finance and mm-hmm. was conservative. And he, in the first or second session, asked me, so I see in the disclosure that this and this, is that going to be a problem? And so, and it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. I could see how it might be for some therapists, and of course you should disclose that in your disclosure and screen people out. It is... A questionable practice if you're discriminating against people but we can talk about that another time but if you're okay with it and I was I with a client who is conservative even a client who voted for Trump and wears a MAGA hat like I I, I see people beyond those beliefs I see the core of the human being and I have enough love to give those people as well mm-hmm. <laughs> and if they come to therapy in, in good faith, even if they're talking about half the session, how much they love Trump. I, <laughs> I just don't, I just don't think of people like that. In, right. It's just content. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. now if I'm sitting on the bus next to someone as they're rent, that's a different situation. <laughs> but with a client, it's almost always the case that my clients will have some point of view or some value or some lifestyle that, at the very least, I can't identify with and maybe even think in my personal life that would be a problem for me if, if mm-hmm. we were friends or if we were a family member. But the philosophy or the place or the, the sacredness of therapy is so beyond that kind of detail to mm-hmm. me. So if, for example, Simone, your therapist being anti-vaccine is also similar to us and that they the therapist would see beyond that and would not create an unsafe environment for you then i would say you know consider that and i think that i get it that given the landscape and given just how contentious things are when you're in con i mean like for me I, it's just so weird like with a maga person it's just so weird for me to even see them i don't even know if i've ever seen a maga hat in real life I think I've only seen it on television and 99% of the time it's on Donald Trump's head, but I I'm pretty sure there are millions of them all over the place in other communities, you know? And if I ran into someone like that in my personal life, like I, 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 I imagine I would have a fair amount of rage and mm-hmm. uh, it would be really hard for me to uh, restrain, you know, if I was at a family get together and, one of my family members was wearing a MAGA hat. Like, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I wouldn't leave. I, I mm-hmm. might just be, I can't, fuck, I can't. I just can't. I'm out. <laughs> I got better things to do than to sit here. And I just want to knock that hat off that, that person's so, head. But so if, you, so if you saw a picture of your therapist in a MAGA hat, could you continue to be their client? Right. Would that be a safe environment for you? If I really liked them, then yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's deeper than that. And I, and that's why I'm, I guess that's my point is I, I worry for our society that we label people as 
and it encapsulates as their, other as it encapsulates their mm-hmm. entire personality. And I think it is the dehumanization. It's a basic. It's basically a dehumanization subset. Mm-hmm. You will see a MAGA hat and, and dehumanize them or reduce them to that one thing, instead of really noting of all the similarities. In fact. I have this philosophy, and the science demonstrates this as well, but I actually get a lot of emotional satisfaction by reading research and also following YouTubers and other commentators who actually will point out the similarities between a progressive liberal and a MAGA person. There are so many things that they agree on, Mm -hmm. and the differences are notable, but they are the things that are only talked about. Mm -hmm. We share so much in common with our fellow Americans, regardless of their political leanings. And I feel like at the very least that should be discussed at times, Mm -hmm. because I I feel like if we only talk about the differences, then we get what we get, Mm -hmm. which is what we got. And it's getting- It's not pretty. It's it's getting worse. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, this got is getting more gotten. (laughs) And I guess if I were to really follow that philosophy fully then I, if i had a family member with a maga hat then i i should shut the fuck up and, and just <laughs> give that person a hug yeah uh, yeah uh, uh, yeah yeah i mean there is a you know i think there's what you kind of want from your therapist and then there's what you can get are you going to agree on absolutely everything probably not are there lines in the sand for you then stay true to that I could not see someone who was anti-drag. So let's just give that as an example, since it's like so up. You could not see a therapist. Yes. Could you see a client? Yes. But for someone to hold my emotional space, I would need them to appreciate and adore and feel comfortable in the world that I feel comfortable with. Do Do I agree with all of my clients? No. But I am holding the frame of therapy for them. What if the therapist was anti-drag, but in therapy, as you're talking about drag or drag-related topics, they embody and in their soul have no ill will or um, don't have any real... see if I can uh, sniff it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a gut thing here. And I think I know, you know, when like someone does not get the world that you're talking about at all but also like i know therapists are really hard to find right now like are you gonna find kind of your absolute perfect therapist right now maybe not yeah yeah and i i I just think that we should all do our best but also i think given especially like the twitter culture that we should be cautious about this uh, there needs to be a word for it. This like one view rejection of mm-hmm. someone. I don't know. Like, so uh, I would think of it as a single issue voter. Okay. Yeah. So single issue rejection. Mm-hmm. Single. Yeah. Rejecting someone on the basis of a single issue. Reducing someone to a single issue. Making assumptions about someone based on a single issue. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it's possible that for Simone, if you have someone that's if you have a therapist anti-vaccine, you might also think they're, they have all sorts of views that are not of your views. Also, there might be this assumption that they're, like you're saying, they're not safe. They're some crazed lunatic that it will try to gaslight you into believing that vaccines are bad. Or I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, it, it could be. <laughs> you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but it's not necessarily true. So anyway, let's take a break. And we get back. Let's talk about forced forgiveness, which is what you want to talk about. So, Rebecca, you texted me randomly a week ago-ish and said, let's talk about forced forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, huh, that sounds like an interesting topic. What's the background for this idea? So, I this has just always kind of been out there for me, this idea of a forgiveness practice and that you had to forgive your abuser or the person that wronged you for your healing. Um, we've talked about this in the past about my own experience, um, but I just thought it was really interesting that it was back in the news again. Like, do you, is forgiveness kind of necessary? Um, and what's the culture that produces this idea that you have to forgive? Um, what is that about? Mm-hmm. Well, I did a whole Ooh. deep dive on apologies mm-hmm. 
And as a part of that, I felt compelled to also do a mini deep dive on forgiveness. And it's complicated because what do we mean by forgiveness? For a lot of people, they mean forgiveness. So I have a, a, a list of things that, at least for me and my definition, forgiveness is not the following things. Forgiveness is, is not forgetting mm-hmm. necessarily. Mm-hmm. Because, for example, if you forgave your abuser, would that mean you just forgot it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, forgiving is, is not f- uh, forgiving someone for harming someone else. Like, mm-hmm. you can't forgive someone for abusing someone else because mm-hmm. that only they can forgive that person. Also, it's not excusing the person. Mm-hmm. It's not pardoning the person. It's not necessarily letting go. It's not condoning. It's not minimizing. It's not necessarily a reconciliation. You can forgive someone and say, yeah, but I don't ever want to fucking see you again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I forgive you, but I, I don't, I, I'm drawing a boundary. <laughs> also, forgiving, forgiveness is not suppressing your anger. Mm-hmm. You can have anger after forgiveness. It's also not a, Social, there's also not a so, social obligation for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. It's not a, there's also not a morality, you know, because that's one thing that I, I talked that a lot about because, you know, Christians, mm-hmm. it's you a... have to forgive. Well, like so... Toxic, toxic forgiving. It's a... Uh, there's debate. Forgive and, and forget? Is this what we're talking about? Well, no. The, uh, there, if you talk to some Christians, they will, in my view, they will simplify the human experience and also perhaps what God is trying to tell you Mm -hmm. that they will simplify it to you need to rush to forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's a sin not to forgive, but there's philosophy within Christian, you know, the Christian dialectic that that is not what the Bible, that's not what God tells you to Mm do that. Definitely not the Jewish God. Jewish God is not forgiving. So yeah. And that but and that's the whole that's one of the main differences that that Christians will delineate from other religions is that Jesus forgave mm-hmm. you know he turned the other cheek instead of eye for an eye that kind mm-hmm. of thing and it's an important exploration but uh, but many many people in the Christian culture whether they identify as Christians or not, but if you're in American culture, you live in a dominant Christian culture, you will have this notion that somehow you're being wrong or you're being a bad person or you're holding on to anger or you're being purposely vindictive if you're not forgiving. And that is just a ridiculous notion. Forgiveness is a, it's a process. It's a voluntary process. You're, you're under no obligation to forgive. You can, choose to never forgive the rest of your life and Mm -hmm. there's no uh, necessarily a a problem with that obviously but also we have to define what forgiveness means to begin with well and I'm really you know I'm kind of really struck by the kind of Gwyneth Peltro goop like you know I'm just open I'm just feeling good I'm just the best me and that idea that that best me doesn't hold like the complexity of that person's life, if that makes sense. Like, sometimes I feel like forgiveness really wipes away how deeply impactful something has been on somebody. So are you saying, like, the Gwyneth Peltro type people will deny their own trauma and anger and act like everything's fine? It's, from what I've seen and what's targeted, like, I am the Gwyneth Peltro, I'm one of the targeted demographics for my age. And so I get a lot of that stuff of like, just feel good. Just, you know, open your yoni to the stone and everything will be better. <laughs> like, I think my Literally life, open your yoni to the stone? Yes. She had these stones that she sold that were like supposed to make everything better that they had to take off the market because it was false advertising. The more I hear about Gwyneth Paltrow and her products, the more I think she has a fetish about forcing things <laughs> up people. <laughs> She may. And Gwyneth, if you'd like to write in so that we can talk about this, we'd be happy to talk about it with you. Um, so let me take this. In she doesn't want to talk with me because I, <laughs> I would I would lay out the, the little I know of the pseudoscientific claims and the harmful claims that she has propagated. Uh, I don't think she wants to talk to me. So let me just spin it the other way because I had a kind of a profound experience. There was reason for me to reach out to 
world famous trauma trainer, Dr. Janina Fisher. And I had a question for her about working with clients that were hopeless. Um, and she, as she always does, she wrote right back. And she said, um, she said that she tells clients that hopelessness is a body memory of how hopeless they felt at the time of the trauma occurring. And um, when I think about like, you know, just forgive, just kind of move on, give that person back love. Um, it That doesn't reflect how profoundly we've been damaged in the moment by these situations. And mm -hmm. although hopelessness can be kind of awful, I see in my clients more activation and more healing if we can sit with the hopelessness for a while, mm -hmm. as opposed to if we have to rush right over it to forgiveness. And not that like forgiveness isn't out there, but just like, let's not miss um, the growth that can happen from sitting with uncomfortable feelings. Yeah, and I had to think a, think a long time about what forgiveness exactly is. Mm -hmm. And I kept changing, in fact, as I was doing the deep dive, I even started changing the definition even further. And there's a lot of definitions of it, but here's the definition that I landed on, which it's long. It's longer than the definition for apology. Mm. So forgiveness is an intentional process. Mm -hmm. So you're doing it intentionally. That eventually results, eventually results. It's a long you know, process. Because a lot of people will be like, okay, I just forgive. Or can't you just <laughs> forgive me? And it's like, well, I can start to go on an intentional process that will eventually result at a decision, mm -hmm. you know, you're eventually deciding to end one's negative attitudes and feelings towards the transgressor. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that you don't have anger at times. It doesn't mean that you don't judge that person for having harmed you. It doesn't, you know, you might have all those feelings still, but generally speaking, and it's, you know, how, where's the line between ending your negative attitudes and feelings versus occasionally also hating that that person harmed you. You know, it, it's a, it's a squishy area and also to contrast it with acceptance of an apology mm -hmm. so you can accept someone's apology like i accept your apology but you don't necessarily forgive them you're like mm -hmm. i accept that what your i accept your apology is mostly sufficient and i appreciate that you apologized you you can say that without forgiving mm -hmm. you can also forgive without ever getting an apology depending right so it's an intentional process that eventually results in a decision to end one's negative. Like a, in the stark example of having been sexually abused as a child, and you end up going on an intentional process that eventually results in a decision to end your negative attitude towards that person. At that point, when you reach that point of forgiveness, you are you still have anger. You you still remember. You're mm -hmm. still traumatized. You're still damaged you're still angry, you still judge, and you. one way of looking at it is you don't, in your mind, have an overall negative association with that person. Mm -hmm. You might have some compassion for them, you might understand them. Whether you interact with them or not is, is irrelevant, but say if you did, you might be able to actually have an interaction with mm -hmm. them. You, you don't forget, you might have upwellings of trauma, you might have upwellings of anger, but you have crossed over a threshold that I think most of us know what that feels like when, mm -hmm. uh, like with, um, a, you know, I think a real common example is in, in a long-term relationship, <laughs> there's a lot of- Constant. <laughs> transgressions and right. forgiveness, whether there's apologies or not. and there's that point where you're in the cycle of conflict, say three days after ups and downs, you eventually just cross this threshold where, you know, for me with my wife, I can feel that threshold being crossed where I feel like I can be relaxed mm -hmm. and normal around her as opposed to uptight and angry and hurt. Uh, it doesn't mean I forget what happened. Does it mean that, I'm not still kind of pissed about it mm -hmm. a little bit, but there's a there's a feeling, there's a vibe of crossing that threshold, and uh, I think it's important to to recognize that because it's a it's an emotional process 
an intentional emotional process that you go on. And for some people, you might go on that intentional emotional process for 15 years and never cross that threshold because you, you got a lot of shit to work out. So that, that forgiveness takes a long time. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of it has to do with healing. A lot of it might depend on an apology, mm-hmm. on someone making up for it. Uh, it might not, but a lot of it might depend on uh, having the, uh, the damage of the transgression healed from in in variety of ways so you know it's complicated Mm -hmm. so what brought up this idea of being forced to forgive for you well i mean definitely with the passing of my mom and those Mm. days right before so many of her friends were like you have to forgive her right now and i was like really so what do you think they're coming from what are they operating from i have thought about this a lot i think that they needed to feel like my mother was a really good person and the idea that her own daughter was very angry at her was hard for them to hold and made them uncomfortable that the idea that Rosella had been such a bad mom that her daughter would not forgive her in her final moments I mean that's like if you think and also I mean think about how forgiveness is portrayed in the movies and like you know the idea that I wouldn't do it, talk about our earlier question of like not, I'm not complying to social norms, right? We're not having the storybook moment. Especially about something like that. Yeah. Um, so the idea that this older person could say to me, Rebecca, be good and forgive your mom. And I could say, uh, uh, no, no. Why? Why would I, po- oh, how and How? And then everything I discovered at the house when I was there, I was like, thank God I didn't forgive her. If you can imagine if I'd forgiven her, gone there, cleaned up all that stuff that showed how complicit she was in my abuse. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pattern. I think it's also a human bias, a preference that there's no messiness in the world. Mm -hmm. And thus, if someone has a complicated feeling, you want to snuff it out as an outsider which i just find to be so strange like what is it to these other people i mean Mm -hmm. they can have their relationship with her and they can think she's a wonderful person that's that they're entitled to that and they can recognize huh i guess she wasn't great to her daughter Mm -hmm. (laughs) that you know those things can exist together they're having cognitive dissonance i'm not right but they're very uncomfortable that Rosella will not be attended to by her daughter in the end. Right. You're not going to them and say, you have to recognize that she was a bitch. And until you, until you do, then, you know, I think another myth out there is that if you don't forgive, it will cause damage in you. Yeah. I mean, so many, that's what the rabbi said to me. It's like, if you don't do this now, you'll feel really sorry. And, you know, I'm a pretty attuned person. I kind of did some soul searching and it was like, yeah, I don't. I don't think that's true. Yeah, um, I don't think flying across the country to a state where I can't eat any of the food to attend to a woman that doesn't want me there. Uh, I don't think anything is going to get resolved in these next three days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and it also just has to do with our general discounting of emotions in general. You mm-hmm. know, I, there's also a myth out there that I don't feel like you and I might live in this world, but there are certain groups of people where you must unconditionally love and appreciate and respect your parents Mm -hmm. regardless of what they do. And to not love your parents, to not forgive your parents, to talk ill of your parents is somehow like a sacrilegious thing. And it automatically means you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. It means you're a bad kid. You're, you don't appreciate. And I just want to say, and I have said to these people, well, you know, God bless you that you had parents that allowed you to worth loving that to have that uh, uh, attitude. I mean, I did. My mm-hmm. parents are wonderful, and it would be a complete dick move if I were to be a dick to them in any sort of a way. I mean, they had to deal with me as a thirteen-year-old for <laughs> Christ's sake. Um, but uh, I mean, no joke. But uh, but that's my parents. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, not everyone has parents like that and to uh, apply that rule to everyone is is I, I just don't understand why people have this this obsession with controlling how other people feel and think right i mean i think it's some of it is assuming that these social norms it goes back to the non-binary conversation that we were having at the beginning 
they assume that these social norms are needed for our society to function when it's actually not true. I can not love my mom and live a perfectly happy life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always say this to my clients, like if it was possible to love her, I would. Yeah, right. That's the thing that I always say as well, not always, but is that the road to cognitively and verbally rejecting Lud's parents has so many barriers to it that for someone to finally get there, it means it it's a it, it was they, my they, only option. They could, they should have been. Most people who get to where you're at mm-hmm. should have been there way earlier. But they kept holding on. They kept hoping. They kept trying. They kept pleading. They kept barking up that tree. They kept banging their head against the wall. I mean, I don't know anyone who just flippantly decides to conclude that their parents were harmful overall Hmm. and or that they hated their parents or something. There's so many internal pressures and maybe even some kind of biological mandate or something to to try to make it work. you want to be part of the tribe, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when someone gets there, in fact, if anything as a society, we should be telling people the opposite of like, you know, you might be in a category of individual where it'd be a lot healthier if you drew boundaries and concluded that your that your parents or parents were, are a negative overall mm-hmm. element in your life and you're holding on way too long to false hope and a social expectation of you need to try to make it work because of this magical idea that they're your biological parents and somehow that obligates you. Um, Met, way more people are in that category mm-hmm. that need that that should be allowed and maybe pushed towards hatred of their parents because of the resistance to that you know so the fact that you got there whenever i hear that from someone i'm like oh boy you must have been through some serious mm-hmm. shit it right it, it, i mean you think it's undoubtedly easy? justified <laughs> when when someone hates their parent assume that it is a hundred percent justified yeah i mean i always say to people like you know, in what way do I possibly benefit from being estranged from my mother? If you think about how much our culture tells us that I need a mother and I need family and family's the most important thing. And, you know, imagine by the time I'm 15, I'm like, oh, my family, my mother is toxic. I have to do what I can to stay away from her. Mm-hmm. And then nothing throughout my adult life dissuades me from that. Mm-hmm. Now, asterisk to you parents out there who have kids who might exhibit that they hate you (laughs) and you didn't deserve it, seemingly. There There are some kids, maybe even young adult kids, who might say things like they hate you, but in the end, that's not the place that they land. You know, lots of kids will go through a lot of difficulties for one reason or another, and they might go through a phase of okay. hating of deeply deep I've been there with families where there'd be a kid who at least from the looks of it there wasn't a justifiable reason as to why this kid was just so really bullying of one of their parents okay. and with help and I would never tell the kid you have to love your parent and you can't do that uh, but with emotional help and communication and attachments and venting a lot of the times, if not all the time, the kid would emerge out of that face. So it's not like every time a kid or a adult child hates their parents, it's not without its difficulty or uh, that it's always quote unquote justified. So, And that's why I'm using the word estranged versus hate because hmm. I, there's also a piece of physical proximity. Like lots of kids say they hate their parents, but they still re- are in their orbit. <laughs> And there's another story where it's not safe to be in their orbit. And like, I have tons of friends whose teenagers are just being super toxic right now, but they also come home for visits or, you know, there's like a, an attunement or an attempt to connect that's really different than when you're truly estranged from someone and you just can't connect in any way. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I think there's a, yeah, there's a difference between having some difficulties and concluding that overall this person is a is not a good idea to have in my life that kind of thing you know so i don't know i guess that's complicated but there when i hear the things that i hear from you i'm just like i don't need to hear any justification people don't get to where you're at Mm. unless there's more than enough justification Mm -hmm. you know anyway all right 
Okay. Well, <laughs> let's end it there. Okay, it's been fun. What's the final word, Rebecca? The final word is take care of yourself because... Well, you should take care of yourself because it's the right thing to do to yourself. And going to therapy and eating right, getting good mm -hmm. sleep, flossing, taking some time after yoga to just stare at the ceiling and mm -hmm. soak it in is what you should be doing. And self-love is glorious. When you love yourself, you're glorious to be around and you're going to crazily attract other people who are glorious as well. <laughs> <laughs>